Good, good morning, everyone. Lovely to get together on this slightly chilly morning. And but some positive news, it's the first day of our less, lesser lockdown. Today, we're very lucky to have Ruth Everson with us. And I'll just read out a little background to her. Ruth Everson taught English for 39 years. Her teaching was always shaped by her passion for empowering others through the unusual tool of poetry and leadership. She served as leadership director of St. Stivian's Girls College until 2018. Ruth uses her poetry to help people from all walks of life find and embrace their purpose and become a more adventurous version of themselves through her workshops, talks, and writing. Her enormously popular 2013 anthology of new and selected works is now in its fourth reprint. During the talk, you can add comments or questions in the chat section of the screen. At the end of the talk, Ruth will answer or comment on the questions. Thank you, Ruth. Let's. Thank you, Ruth. I will now hand over to Ruth. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. And before we start, a big thank you to Andrew, who has worked, who has worked so hard in the background to get all the technical things sorted out. And we just go with the flow and whatever happens, happens because that is life. We have no control over that. So thank you very much, Andrew. Um, and also to Marlene, who's been working very hard in the background. So it's a great pleasure to be with you this morning, U3A. Um, I've sat in the auditorium on many occasions as part of you. And it's very special now to be the one who is in front. Poetry has been very kind to me, uh, although sometimes perhaps having a poetic mind is not kind because it makes you see the world constantly and ask questions constantly. And so what I would like to do this morning is to share some of those questions with you, because for me, uh, as Einstein said, not that I know a lot about Einstein and his theories, but Einstein said it is not the answer that we should be looking for, but the question. And our life is informed by the questions that we ask and the quality of the questions that we ask. And so my poems really are in answer to questions that have come up and I've needed to answer them. And these are my answers. The talk is called Poetry is Dangerous. And it was many years ago that I was reading an art book. And in that art book was one sentence that said, the apartheid government considered poetry to be more dangerous than a hand grenade. And that really caught my thinking because that's true, isn't it? When we have revolutions, when we have ceremonies of any kind, it's not Einstein's theories that are presented. It's not a spreadsheet. It's not an elegant equation. It's the poems, the songs, the dances, the arts that really speak for us in those moments, revolutionary songs. And so this poem comes from that idea that poetry can wake us up in a moment. It can ask us to enter into the heart of ourselves in a most unexpected way. So, poetry is dangerous. Poetry is dangerous. Poetry is a hot rush of passion, foot flat to the page, words flashing past on either side, driving through full stops down every one-way line, tempting death or derision till the ink tank runs dry. Poetry is dangerous. Poetry flickers fork-tongued after midnight, coiling through inky convolutions, spitting phrases at the moon-eyed night. Poetry lies languorously, constricting words. It swallows the cold-blooded poet, sheds a stanza, and slithers on. Poetry is dangerous. Poetry will attack when you least expect it. Poetry is rebellion, rolling you and the world. Poetry will write your tears in ink. Poetry will hang your soul on barbed wire lines, but the rhythm will beat in your bubbling blood, driving you to dance to the serpent's song. I am, you are, 
we are its implacable voice. Poetry will write your tears in ink. Poetry will hang your soul on barbed wire lines. Poetry will ask the question at the most inconvenient times. I was lucky enough in December of 2017, I think lucky is the wrong word, um, fortunate enough, having studied uh, logotherapy, which is the work of Viktor Frankl, to be able to go to Auschwitz-Birkenau. And Andrew, if you could put up slide two, please. I was so moved by my experience. It, it changed me profoundly. There was something in me that I can't explain the change, but that visit to Auschwitz and to Birkenau really changed something profoundly in me. And walking through that death camp where Viktor Frankl would have spent his time and come from that place of horror saying, we have one great human choice in life. And the choice that we have is our attitude. And he would say, you can go to the gas chamber but you go either as a victim or a victor. That chills me every time I hear that. What a powerful way to see the world. And he was, we are lucky that he came through that and changed the shape of the world with his book, Man's Search for Meaning, um, and a newly published, by the way, work of uh, lectures, gathering of lectures. But as I walked through Auschwitz, I was particularly caught by this picture. Well, I took this picture and it was in a room full of glasses and hair and Zyklon B canisters and all the horrors in one place of Auschwitz. And it was too much. I was overwhelmed. But here, this pile of shoes, and if you look at the picture very closely, you'll see that there's a reflection against the glass. And there I am, a bystander, looking through the reflections of glass at every life in every shoe. But pulled to the front of that display were a few shoes that had been singled out. And the shoe at the side of the screen is one of them. And I wondered who was the woman who wore that shoe, who put that what would have been a beautiful high heeled shoe on in the morning, red and embroidered, expecting to go out into the day and to come home in those shoes. And I asked the question, how, how, how do we get to this pile of shoes? How are we hidden on the other side of the glass, but seeing the things that happen in the world? But I believe if we can begin to see the one, we can begin to see the all. I wrote two poems about Auschwitz-Birkenau. Uh, the first one is a much longer one. Um, this one is a, a shorter one called Shoe. That shoe, singled out amongst a multitude of horrors. That red shoe, set aside from the muddled tower of black, brown, broken, booted, that red embroidered shoe, high-heeled, waiting for an elegant curve of foot, the slide of silk stockings, the golden tap on a wooden floor, a glide of dance on a star-bright night. That foot in darkness, arching away from cold cement, still. Thank you, Andrew, for the slide. Andrew, you can take the slide away. Thank you. I, on uh, one of the books that also had a profound um, impact on me was Dr. Edith Egger's book, The Choice. And I, I wonder if any of you saw her live webinar on, um, on Sunday night. But reading the book and listening to her webinar, I was struck by two things again. One is, she said, 
The key to anything is in your pocket. And like Viktor Frankl, she says, attitude is everything. Circumstance we cannot decide on. We can only respond to that. And she says the key is in our pocket. We have the solution to everything that comes at us. And she said this powerful thing. Pray for your enemy. When she was dancing for Mengele, pray for your enemy. How wonderful to have that spirit that can rise above and beyond every circumstance. And I can't think of anything that could be worse than dancing for Mengele in the horror of Auschwitz. Asking the question asks us also to come to self. If we are to use the key in the pocket, if we are to pray for our enemy, there needs to be a quiet and a centered place within self. And so I want you to imagine, to take you away from those shoes for a moment, and to imagine a beautiful place, a place that was a sanctuary for you, a place that you would long to go back to in this overcast morning, a place of beauty. And just to be still. And if you are quiet, and if you are quiet, still there must be time and time for the old gods, gnarled, gentle fingers, roots dipped in molten core, wet, blue balancing summer skies on a rainbow of green on green. If you are quiet, you may enter in beneath the boughs on moss-slippered praying feet. There they will meet with you. There they will meet with you. Barked, feathered, bright-eyed, overwhelmed and quivering with life. If you are quiet, they will let you hear a wind of wind wilding itself around the world, whispering the stories of stories of things you always knew. Whispering the stories of stories of things you always knew. And if you dare, and if you will, you may find the old self, not felled as you once thought, but firm-footed, branching down long and strong to pull the sap from the center of the stone of your heart. Home now, home now, in the roaring silence of yourself, be brave enough to be still. Home now, home now, in the roaring silence of yourself, be brave enough to be still. The great Sufi poet Rumi says this, listen, make a way for yourself inside yourself. Mary Oliver, one of my favorite poets, tells us that attention is devotion. And so as we pay attention to the world and to ourselves, it is a form of prayer and devotion. If you are brave, and if you will, and if you dare, can you go? to that quiet, centered place within yourself. Life, of course, is journey, isn't it? And uh, I, this is a roller coaster, by the way. Um, I'm taking you on a roller coaster ride of poetry. So I hope you are uh, safely strapped in. I was asked uh, last year to write a poem that encompassed the history of St. Stivian's College in Randburg. And that history goes back to 563. Now, 563, um, I didn't realize this when I was writing the poem because it was last year. Uh, but looking up, um, a friend discovered that 563 was actually the worst year to ever be alive in. Uh, there were vo volcanic eruptions. The lands were covered with volcanic ash. There was no rain. Um, there was famine, people were starving, 
And just to add to that, so if you think 2020 has its moments, moments, there was also a thing called the Yellow Death, which is described by a writer of the time as a yellow miasma crossing the land. Living in a little village in um, Ireland was a woman called Etain, and she lived at the confluence of the Shannon and the Boyle rivers. And she was a healer. And she would uh, heal people and go to a holy well that she had and use the water from the well. And in 1563, when this terrible illness came, she made a choice. And her choice was to leave. But she left with her brother and her sister in this little boat. Andrew, can you bring up slide three, please? Can you imagine three people sitting in that little coracle? It's a, it's a wicker basket made for fishing on flat water. And you can see from the strap that it's designed for one. But three of them got into this little vessel, made their way 370 kilometers down the Shannon River to Limerick. Didn't stop when they got to Limerick. They went out into the Atlantic Sea the Celtic Sea, the Irish Sea, finally washing up on a beach in Perrinporth, Cornwall, where Etain, as she won the, was then, moved a little bit inland and began her healing once more. The village was named after her, and that village, with a slight variation on her name, became Stythian, and the founders of St. Stythians came from that area. So Etain in 563, undertaking an impossible journey. In the 14th century, mid 14th century, Andrew, could you bring up the next slide, please? This is Mother Julian of Norwich, and she lives through the Black Plague, the Black Death. She doesn't go away, though. She journeys into the heart of prayer. And she sees in the world the, the hazelnut is an important symbol for her. And she sees in that little hazelnut the entire meaning of God as he looks at us. And in that hazelnut, she says, there is a force of love moving through the universe that holds us fast and will never let us go. And we must go back to that force of love that moves through the universe as small as a hazelnut. And in this hazelnut, she sees three things. God made it, God loves it, God keeps it. Edith Ego of the Choice believes what got her through Auschwitz was that she was made by God, loved by God, and kept by God. Thank you, Andrew. So those two women brought me to another poem called the holy well. Where do you go when there's nowhere to go? Where do you go when there's nowhere to go? Where do you stand when solid ground sinks to sea? This is the turning time. This is the turning time. Turn despair into a divining rod. Dive deeper into self than you've ever been. Find the holy well of your heart. Find the holy well of your heart. It is not empty. It is not empty. You have drawn on it before when you were sure pain had seeped its poison into the depths. There was still clear water. Enough. Enough to fill a silver thimble of hope. Remember its taste on your tongue like sun. Then slowly, a sip of stars, a cup of moon, the dry grass greening under your tears. Come, rest, hand on heart, feel the steady flow of hope. All shall be well, and all shall be well. And all manner of thing shall be well. Let it be well with your soul. 
That last prayer is Mother Julian's prayer, and it was given to me on a small medallion by a very dear and precious friend, and at a time when I was under a lot of stress. And that became my mantra, and now I use it every single day. It changes the way I see the world. Let it be well. All shall be well. And all shall be well. And all manner of thing shall be well. Let it be well with your soul. Let it be well with your soul. One of my <clears throat> favorite role models is a woman called Grandma Moses. And Grandma Moses uh, was a folk artist. As a child and through her life, she loved art. It, it was always a passion. And she did beautiful needlework. <clears throat> but as she got older, uh, around about 78, she started developing arthritis. And it was her sister who said to her, well, why don't you try painting? <clears throat> because painting is not as hard on your hands, but the, the needlework is, is obviously a lot harder to do. And so at age 78, Grandma Moses started painting and she became one of the most famous and beloved American painters and continued painting until she was 101. Edith Egger wrote her first book, The Choice, age 90. She's just written a second book, age 92, called The Gift, which will be out in September and I look forward to that. Viktor Frankl uh, tried to learn to fly or he became a pilot at age 75. And I would always think about this and think, well, let that be a lesson to you, Ruth. You are 64. Now get up and do something worthwhile. And that's true. At any age in our life, we can begin. But as I was unpacking the dishwasher this morning and just thinking about today and what I was going to say, I had another thought. And that is that these people never stopped. They didn't wait for life to come to them. They went to life in the most awful of circumstances. We can turn to life. And so this poem written four years ago, I've just told you I'm 64. This poem written four years ago speaks to that. And it's called Mostly Water because we are made up mostly of water. <clears throat> I'll be 60 soon. There, I said it, my number's up. The house is still standing firm. As far as I can tell, there's no fire on the moon. I've been to ceremonies dedicated to dust. I've scattered a lifetime of ashes, but I'm not ashy or dusty yet. I'm mostly water and running. I'm not ashy or dusty yet. I'm mostly water and running. There's a river raging through my heart, tumbling in torrents through my thighs, wearing boulders to rocks in the bend of a knee, turning pebbles to sand in the palm of my hand. Of course, there have been droughts. Of course, there have been droughts and dams and silt and stink and mud we all know the ebb and the flow, the nights thick and awash with blood. But in the delta of my heart, something fertile fresh is stirring. I may be close to home. I may be close to home. Who knows? Still, I turn to the scent of the sea. Still, I turn to the scent of the sea. Perhaps a little bit like Ulysses, who cannot rest from travel, but must drink life to the lees and not rust unburnished, but shine in use. There is, Tennyson tells us in that magnificent poem, some work of noble note yet to be done. Come, my friends, it is not too late. Here we are. One, one collection of U3A heroic hearts, striving to seek, to find, to yield, yet not to yield. And so 
that idea of water and yield takes me to another thought. <clears throat> Working with many people, um, as I do in my, in my role as a life coach, so many of us, and I include myself in this, get stuck. Psychiatrists tell us that we have about five to eight defining events in our lives. I wonder if you can think of one while I just have a sip because my voice has gone a bit croaky. <clears throat> we have uh, these defining events in our lives and for me a defining event was at age eight and I won't go into the details of that but I was fascinated to find that a little piece of history about ancient Rome and apparently for the ancient Romans when someone died they would cry the tears into a little glass vial and they would bury the tears with the dead. And I thought, what a wonderful gesture that was to cry your grief and to bury the tears with the dead. And that idea of being able to deal with our tears, because there are some things where the tears will always come if we think about them too much. But to be able to take some of that and to bury the tears with the dead. <clears throat> And so that became this poem for my brother Paul, who died age 11, and it's called Roman Tears. The ancient Romans filled a vial with tears and buried it with their dead. They watered death with salty life to settle the dry dust of grief and did not embalm their hearts with pain. My tears have run useless through life. They are hard, swallowed, fear stored. If I could cry and catch the single tear that has drowned me all my life, I would swim in the ocean of myself. If I could cry and catch the single tear that has drowned me all my life, life I would swim in the ocean of myself. You'll notice that my theme this morning really is small moments, catching small moments and I wonder if there are tears that drown you where you could be released by, as I've had to do, praying for an enemy finding the key in my own pocket, understanding my impact on the world and accepting the impact of others and deciding at 64 that life still has a lot of purpose and a lot of meaning and a lot of places to go. So one of our great icons, I hope you're all still with me. I am trying to go through the poem slowly and uh, there will be a recording of this if you if you want them again. And I'm also happy to provide you with the poems if anybody wants them. But Mediba, one of our great icons, and reading about Mediba and coming across uh, again that small piece of information, and again it's a shoe, and there is that idea of shoe and footprint and legacy and how we leave our footprint in the world. And apparently, Mediba wore a size 9 shoe. Subsequently, I've been told it was a size 11, but I'm not too worried about that. What I'm worried about is not the shoe, but the footprint. And I was lucky enough to have this poem performed by two of my pupils um, at Mediba's Houghton House during the centenary celebrations. And it's called Mediba 9. <clears throat> you could buy a pair of shoes, size 9, that would fit the feet of this man, but you will not walk in them. You will not walk in them. You will not smooth the quarry stones into the long road of forgiveness or write in blood words of love. This man's foot shifted the dying dust, lifted from lost 
tired, tattered hope. This man unraveled the blackness to free the barbed, bound, wounded rainbow, held it high and wonder wide for all to see. If you would dare, if you would dare to walk in this man's shoes, you must stride alone towards your truth. You must stride alone towards your truth, believing that perhaps, just perhaps, one other will come to walk at your side. There's that word dare again. And Edith Ego, who says, the big things in life are to dare and to risk. What dare we do at whatever age and place we are in? What dare we do? Can you walk your truth and find one other to walk at your side? I find a great deal of joy in nature. And one of my particular birds that I love is a very silly bird called the fiery neck nightjar. But it has a particularly beautiful call. And Andrew, I'm going to ask you, please, to go to slide five for me. <clears throat> Thank you, Andrew. So that is the fiery neck night, Joe, and I like this picture that I found of him with the, the moon at his back, and it, it is appropriate to the poem I'm about to use. Thank you, Andrew. The fiery neck night, Joe, uh, the call, if you look it up in a bird book, it's good Lord deliver us, good Lord deliver us. And going to sleep one evening just at the beginning of the lockdown and <clears throat> in, the, in the terrible new anxiety of the pandemic. And I suppose in a way we've almost got used to this, this anxiety that we live with now. But <clears throat> thinking of the, the prayer of the fiery neck nightjar and thinking of all the people I love and what could happen because there's no, no saying where this virus will go and who we will lose. And so I thought of this poem, The Prayer of the Fiery Necked Nightjar. When the world winds in to sleep, I wake to the light I memory keep. Wild Swarovski stars roll across the night, packed so tight, only a fine line draws dark edges in the shine. A mischievous cherub has painted the Milky Way thick with glitter. The air is sharp against my cheek. Fiery necked night jars call in scattered chorus. Good Lord, deliver us. Good Lord, deliver us. An eye green gleam of leopard turns her head to listen while curving her crescent claws. A roar of lion rumbles across my skin. Still, good Lord, good Lord, deliver, deliver us. When the stars are still enough, I unwrap the names of all my loves to hang them on a filigree thread around the necks of the brightest stars, safe under the unblinking eye of the moon. I wake when the dark birds begin to sing, magicking them up to the paling stars. They return in a murmuration around my head. Sparrows, starlings, swallows and fiery finches bring my loves back for another day. I count them carefully into my heart, one by one. You are missing. You are missing. Then he comes, a tiny iridescence having stopped to sip on a low bloom of sun. He drops your name covered in sweetness and you are home and safe, my love. Good Lord, good Lord, deliver us again tonight.
Good Lord, good Lord, deliver us again tonight. Let it be well with your soul. I want to, to end with a call. A call to courage, a call to daring, a call to risk, and a call to stretch. And this poem is called Vuga Papama. And Vuga Papama means wake up and wake up quickly. Vuga Papama. You must believe that you can rise. Vuga Papama. Get up. Get up. Shed yesterday's memory muddled sheets. This is not the time for sleeping. Life is flowing under the tired mattress. Beyond the dark, tight night curtains, a furious sun is beating. Leave the bed, heavy with old excuses and hungry hurts. This is the time for courage. This is the time for courage. Wars, wars. Grass is springing up between the floorboards. The fearful house is flooding away. You know that you must get up. Vuga Papama, get up, rise. It is time. You know that you must rise. Get up. It is time. And so I thank you for the time that you have spent with me and remind you that poetry will attack when you least expect it. It will lead you perhaps to one red shoe, so that in the roaring silence of yourself, you are brave enough to be still enough to let it be well with your soul. Enough to hear the night jar. Good Lord, deliver us. You know that you must rise to swim in the ocean of yourself, believing that one other will come to walk at your side. Let it be well with your soul. Thank you, you 3 a for joining me on my poetic journey this morning. I've loved it. I hope you found something in it that you have enjoyed too. Thank you very, very much, Ruth. We really, I really found it inspiration. Hang on, I'm just going to change. Oh, that's better. Uh, thank you very, very much, Ruth. It was really inspirational. We haven't had any questions yet. Are there any questions anyone wants to key into, into Ruth? Um, I think we're all a bit overwhelmed with the um, spiritual experience. When I hear you use words like, like you do, I really admire and I really wish I wasn't an engineer and a little bit more of a, in the literary side, on your use I of words. Be here without you, <laughs> Andrew, I yeah. wouldn't be here without you. We need our engineers. Please, uh, I've got a message from Marcia. Please repeat names you mentioned. Um, I'm not sure, Marcia, what names you're referring to. Do you, Ruth, are you uh, got I mentioned, any? I mentioned Dr. Edith Egger, her book, The Choice. And uh, she has a new book coming out called The Twelve Gifts. And that book, if you haven't read it, it's, it's absolutely inspirational. So Dr. Edith Egger, E-G-E-R, The Choice. I spoke about uh, Viktor Frankl and man's search for meaning. And he also has a new book of lectures that have been published. Obviously, he's not with us anymore. And it's called Yes to Life in Spite of Everything. So that's a new set of lectures from Viktor Frankl. I mentioned Itain, who was the nun who, who left her little village and went down the Shannon River and across the oceans to land in Cornwall. And she became Saint Itain, and St. Stythians is named after her. Interestingly, because she's Saint Itain and Stythian, St. Stythians is St. St. Stythians, if you want to get the technicals. Um, the other person I mentioned uh, was Mother Julian of Norwich, um, the 14th century mystic, and her prayer, let it be well, uh, all shall be well, all shall be well. Um, and I think, uh, and Mediba I mentioned, obviously, uh, and I spoke about the Romans and their 
uh, using the, the little vial for their tears. Have I left anyone out? That's quite a comprehensive list. No, thank you. I did. I left out Grandma Moses. Grandma mm. Moses, the American folk artist who started her paintings at 78. Okay. Ruth, I'm just going to read. These are comments, not questions, but I think they're worth reading. From Jim Powell, thank you. It lifts the mind. I couldn't agree more. Joyce Schneier, thank you so much for a very absorbing, thought-provoking talk. William Strike, I would love to have a copy of the poems you read. Val Brake, thank you so much, Ruth, for what was truly a roller coaster ride of poetry. So I think we all really appreciated it. And you, the way you turned images into inspiration gave us hope for life and told us to get out there and make it happen. Thank you very, very much, Ruth. I think, sorry, there's another one from William Strike. Thank, many thanks for a very enjoyable talk. Thanks, Thank Ruth. Um, we will be having a copy of this broadcast. I'll be sending things around. Ruth, if there's anything you feel we should circulate, you must just let me know afterwards, like a link to your book or whatever. I just have a link, yeah. They've been turned into PDFs and are very cheap because uh, nobody can go out and buy a book. So there are links to the, the two books, but not to the poems, Holy Well or Prayer of the Fiery Neck Nightjar. I'll send copies of those to you because they are new poems. Yeah, Marcia has just asked you, where can we get your poems? So you answered that yeah, question. So I'll send you the links to the books. And if there's anyone who doesn't want to spend the, the 80 Rand on the books, I'm very happy to also send you the the copies of the poems that I've used in today's talk, and you can circulate those. In fact, I'll do both. So I'll, I'll send you the poems that I've used today, and I'll also send you to the links if anybody wants to read the longer Auschwitz poem or anything else. Yeah, I, and, and I'm, there are just two other comments I'll read out. Marilyn B. Wow, inspiring and thought-provoking, beautiful poem, so well read. You have lifted my withering COVID fearful spirits to rise. I think we all need our spirits to rise after COVID, and hopefully we're on that, yeah. And then Sharon Hasty says, Ruth, what an inspirational time. I so enjoyed listening to you. Where can we hear you again? Uh, and the other things are about your getting copies of your poem, which you've already answered. Yes. All right. Thanks very much, Ruth. I think we're going to end the broadcast now and we'll try Thank and get a copy everyone. and you'll send it through. Thanks very much, All Ruth. Right. Indeed. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye -bye. Have a great time. Great week. Bye.